Hi guys, Slightly Ill Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. So as always, I'm going to check out the blurb, I'm going to go through and um, take a look at my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the psychologist would call it folie de. Bruno slammed his palms together. Hey, Jesus, what an idea. We murder for each other, see? I kill your wife and you kill my father. We meet on a train, see, and nobody knows we know each other. Perfect alibi is catch. From this moment, almost against his conscious will, Guy Haynes is trapped in a nightmare of shared guilt and an insidious merging of personalities. Uh, it's got a quote by Graham Greene, who's one of my favourite authors. Uh, a writer who created a world of her own, a world claustrophobic and irrational which we enter each time with a sense of personal danger. Um, which I think is a pretty, pretty badass uh, little review there. It's a great little quote um, here, it says, All business is legalised throat cutting, like marriage is legalised fornication. And that's from Bruno there, who is basically a nutcase. And Bruno says, know what else I'll do someday? Commit suicide if I happen to feel like committing suicide and fix it so it looks like my worst enemy murdered me. Uh, which is dark, but it is a thought that I have had from time to time. Oh yeah, and then um, <clears throat> Bruno start, uh, sends, sends him a letter. See, this is the thing, is I'd, I'd only, um, I only knew like the pop culture, I guess, ideas behind. Um, uh, strangers on a train and like if they were actually strangers on the train and just happened to meet on that one train and then hatch their plans there And then that was it that would make sense But the problem is, is as soon as they start sending each other letters and he's like calling calling each other and stuff It's like well suddenly you can be tied together, you know and Bruno He uh, remembers a brilliant and powerful thought that came to him last night watching a televised shuffleboard game The way to see the world was to see it drunk everything was created to be seen drunk then he continues, certainly this wasn't the way to see the world, with his head splitting every time he turned his eyes. Oh, we get a typo as well, uh, Bruno shouts something, his voice falset too, with anxiety. It's meant to be his voice falsetto with anxiety. So here's quite a nice little uh, uh, exploration of Bruno's personality um, after he commits the murder, I suppose. So, um, yeah, we get... He was not like the dopes in the newspapers who killed to see what it felt like and never had a bloody thing to report except sometimes a sick making it wasn't as good as I expected. If he were interviewed, he would say, it was terrific. There's nothing in the world like it. Would you ever do it again, Mr. Bruno? Well, I might, reflectively, with caution, as an Arctic explorer when asked if he will winter up north again next year might reply uncommittingly to a reporter. Can you tell us a little bit about your sensations? He would tip the microphone towards him, look up and muse while the world awaited his first word. How had it felt? Well, there's only it, see, and nothing to compare it with. She was a rotten woman anyway, you understand. It was like killing a hot little rat, only she was a girl, so it made it a murder. The very warmth of her had been disgusting, and he remembered thinking that before he took his fingers away. The heat would really have stopped coming. That after he left her, she would grow chill and hideous, like she really was. Hideous, Mr. Bruno? Yes, hideous. Do you think a corpse is hideous? Bruno frowned. No, he did not really think he thought a corpse was hideous. If the victim was evil, like Miriam, people ought to be pretty glad to see the corpse, oughtn't they? Power, Mr. Bruno. Oh yes, he had felt terrific power. That was it. He had taken away a life. Now, nobody knew what life was. Everybody defended it, the most priceless possession, but he had taken one away. That night there had been the danger, the ache of his hands, the fear in case she made a sound. But the instant when he felt that life had left her, everything else had fallen away, and only the mysterious fact of the thing he did remained, the mystery and the miracle of stopping life. People talked about the mystery of birth, of beginning life, but how explainable that was. Out of two live germ cells, what about the mystery of stopping life? Why should life stop because he held a girl's throat too tightly? What was life, anyway? What did Miriam feel after he took his hands away? Where was she? No, he didn't believe in a life after death. She was stopped, and that was just the miracle. Oh, he could say a great deal at his interview with the press. What significance did it have for you that your victim was female? Where had that question come from? Bruno hesitated, then recovered his poise. Well, the fact she was a female had given him greater enjoyment. No, he did not therefore conclude that his pleasure had partaken of the sexual. No, he did not hate women either. Rather hot. Rather not. Hate is akin to love, you know? Who said that? He didn't believe it for a minute. No, all he would say was that he wouldn't have enjoyed it quite so much, he thought, if he had killed a man. Unless it was his father. And we get um, the line, Once as a child he had stared at a mongoloid idiot on a streetcar, he remembered, like this, with a shameless curiosity that nothing could shake. Definitely considered uh, politically incorrect today. All right, just got the one tab to update you on. Um, we've just got to, I've just got to the bit where um, where Guy has committed his murder, and I thought what was really interesting was the way the two murders contrasted. Like Bruno was really self-assured and very confident in his murder, and Guy was just a mess from start to finish, really, um, which is kind of par for the course. That's what you would expect from those two characters. And this is how um, 
guy, guy reacts after like having committed the murder. This is how he feels. And because I've been ill recently, it was kind of weird because it it feels like how I feel. <laughs> so he slept until the following noon, then lay in bed the rest of the day in a torpor that made it agony, even to cross the room to refill his towel with ice. He felt he would never sleep enough to get back his strength. He lay rigid and afraid, sweating and shivering with fear. Then he had to get up to the, go to the bathroom. He had a slight case of diarrhea from fear, he thought, as on a battlefield. Yep, welcome to having the flu, mate. And so this is all kind of about how Guy is reacting now that he knows he's a murderer. So some great little lines. Love and hate, he thought. Now good and evil lived side by side in the human heart. And not merely in differing proportions in one man and the next, but all good and all evil. One had merely to look for a little of either to find it all. One had merely to scratch the surface. All things had opposites close by, every decision a reason against it, every animal an animal that destroys it, the male, the female, the positive, the negative. The splitting of the atom was the only true destruction, the breaking of the universal law of oneness. Nothing could be without its opposite that was bound up with it. Could space exist in a building without objects that stopped it? Could energy exist without matter, or matter without energy? Matter and energy, the inert and the active, once considered opposites, were now known to be one. And Bruno, he and Bruno, each was what the other had not chosen to be, the cast off self, what he thought he hated, but perhaps in reality loved. For a moment he felt as if he might be mad. He thought madness and genius often overlapped too. But what mediocre lives most people lived, in middle waters like most fish. Um, which is very deep, it does show how it can kind of be almost uh, overwritten at times, I suppose. But it is, I mean, it's beautiful, it's just heavy going at, at times I guess and also that quote about madness just reminded me of that that quote by Charles Bukowski which is like some people never truly go mad what boring lives they must lead or something like that and um, this little paragraph here guy kind of steers towards a kid I guess he listens to the um, you know those intrusive thoughts but I just thought that was quite relatable the intrusive thoughts and also this feeling of unreality because I get that all of the time like I feel as though I'm, I don't exist I feel like I'm a ghost especially walking around town I feel like I'm not there and like nobody can see me anyway Guy apologised to the Faulkners as he got back into the car, and they murmured something about such things happening to every driver now and then. But Guy felt their real silence behind him, a silence of shock and horror. He'd seen the boy coming down the side road. The boy had stopped for him, but Guy had swerved the car towards him as if he'd intended to hit him. Had he? Tremulously, he lighted a cigarette. Nothing but bad coordination, he told himself. He'd seen it a hundred times in the past two weeks. Collisions with the revolving doors, his, his inability even to hold a pen against a ruler, and so often the feeling he wasn't here doing what he was doing. And I just thought this was this was cool. So Guy's talking about Anne and um, so uh, Bruno's talk. Bruno and Guy are talking basically, and Bruno goes, "What do you do in the evenings?" Anne sometimes works in the evenings. His mind slid easily, as it never had before with Bruno, to the upstairs studio where he and Anne often worked in the evenings, Anne talking to him from time to time, or holding something up for him to comment on, as if her work were effortless. When she dabbed her paintbrush fast in a glass of water, the sound was like laughter, which I think is a beautiful line. But again, we're getting to this point here where it's like, the, these murders, they would have both got away with it if they just not had any contact with each other afterwards. The problem is, is that Bruno is kind of stalking Guy a little bit. Um, which all happened in the first place because Guy didn't commit his murder, but then, then it, it's, yeah, they never really agreed to. It's an interesting little dynamic they've got going between the two of them, let's put it that way. So it's just something I, I don't like uh, unnecessary uh, adjectives, and Guy says, where we get, yes, I like him, Guy answered, puzzledly. Ew, that is horrible. We get a reference to the fact that Guy used to drink a lot of coffee. You could do worse than watch your nerves a bit, old man, Bob told him. He lifted his coffee cup and drained it contentedly. Well, at least you're not the coffee fiend you used to be. What was it, ten cups a day? Something like that. No, he had cut out coffee entirely, trying to sleep, and now he hated it. It's kind of like me, I used to drink ten cups of coffee a day when I used to work in a, a marketing agency. But it was ten cups of shit coffee, and now I just have one cup of nice coffee per day, you know? And then we get this kind of scene at the end where Guy admits what has happened. Um, and I just thought this was kind of interesting, the argument that anybody, this could have happened to anybody, you know? Uh, he drove me insane too. And listen, I believe any man can be broken down. I could break you down, given the same circumstances. I could break you down and make you kill someone. It might take different methods from the ones Bruno used on me, but it could be done. What else do you think keeps the totalitarian states going? Um, and I just thought that was an interesting argument. I don't know whether it's true or not. I, I suppose no man knows, do you? Like, you would have to do, I don't know, studies into that. Um, but yes, Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. 
it was one of those, it started really strongly and then I felt like it petered out during the second half. Um, I haven't watched the movie yet, so I will be watching that soon. I have a feeling it might be like the talented Mr. Ripley where I enjoy the movie more than the book. Although the book was pretty good, it was a 4 out of 5. It's just the movie is meant to be a classic, it's directed by Hitchcock. Um, and maybe it cuts out some of the, you know, the second half of it was just kind of tedious. Um, it doesn't help that I didn't really like Guy or Bruno. Now I don't think you're supposed to. Um, but yes, and then also I've been a little ill while I've been reading this, so it took me longer to read it than I, than I normally would, and I think that hampered my enjoyment as well. Um, and Highsmith is just quite a wordy writer. Sometimes it works really well, sometimes it's annoying. Um, but yes, overall 4 out of 5, pretty good. So there we have it, that's what I made of Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.